everybody and uh, welcome to this knowledge share session i'm sorry just jody it says you will be live soon oh we are live now oh we're live brilliant it's really good isn't it when you we're on a digital session and we can't make the it work i think we've got it going now so welcome everybody uh to this knowledge share session talking all things digital digital marketing and the language travel sector uh, my name is Jodie Gray and I'm the Chief Executive of English UK. I'm really pleased to be moderating this session today um, and to be joined by three experts in the digital field and representing different points of view. So I'm going to ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves. So just going around on the order of my screen. Andrew, do you want to start and give an introduction? Sure, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to be here. I'm Andrew Green. I'm uh, one of the co-directors of King, along with my three other directors. I have a particular responsibility for marketing, communications and, uh, and IT. Um, and we've been running King for the last 12 years. Prior to that, uh, I had a career in uh, marketing and communications uh, for various organisations and various media companies, including Snapple Tips. So I've been doing this for, for 30 years on and off, um, and hopefully I can, uh, I can uh, contribute. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. And Mesut? Hi, this is Mesut. I am the co-owner and managing director of Atlas Agency and other two agencies in Turkey. We have uh, 125 employees and 18 offices. We are operating mainly from Turkey. And I have been in agency business for 20 years now, more than 20 years. And I have also another career as a university lecturer. I do lecture final year engineering students in project management and multi-career decision making. So I am hoping to contribute to the panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. And Richard? Hi, I'm Richard Bradford, the Managing Director of Disquiet Dog, a digital marketing agency and consultancy specialising in the education, travel and tourism sectors. Um, my background is primarily ELT. I spent about uh, seven years in France, where I was largely running a, a language school over there. Um, came back and worked in sales and marketing in various positions for language schools, uh, but also uh, about 10 years or more in uh, in an agency um, promoting language travel around the world. So kind of sit on both sides of the fence, uh, but now primarily we, we, we try to help um, organizations around the world uh, looking to optimize um, their positioning online uh, and also turnover and return on investment. Thanks, Richard. I think this is such an interesting time to be having this discussion about digital marketing. So the impact of COVID-19 has been so great on the way that businesses within language travel are operating and promoting themselves. Um, and schools, colleges and agents are looking at how they can better communicate with their end users. And whether this is to attract a future business or maintain um, current engagement and current relationships. But what's evident is that because of the impact of COVID-19, we're seeing very limited marketing budgets. Businesses have been forced to stop face-to-face -face teaching in places and stand still with limited opportunities for international travel um, and limited opportunities to send and distribute printed and traditional marketing materials. So digital marketing in its various forms can and could help bridge this gap um, and com in communication. So I think that that's what this uh, session is going to focus on. We've got some questions that we're going to kick off with, but then we're very much hoping that the session is going to be interactive and we'd like um, attendees um, on the call to join in, uh, make comments um, um, either within the chat area or better within the Q&A area of um, the platform. And there'll be an opportunity at the end, the long opportunity at the end to interact and ask questions of our panelists and to get involved in this really interesting um, discussion. So please do join in and, and, and make comments throughout and we'll pick those up um, as we go along. So um, just to kick off and get us started, um, just thinking about um, uh, the kind of conflict between the, the new, the digital and the traditional, so the face-to-face -face and paper-based communications. Starting with you, Mesut, do you still see a role for that traditional form of communication alongside um, the digital? And how can the two be most efficiently integrated? Thank you, Judy. Well, <laughs> the communication and from marketing perspective, there are lots of communications going around within our industry. And 
B2B is, is one thing where schools and agencies have lots of communication grounds. There are workshops, office visits, trainings, agent trainings, panels, and so on. And also the, the other uh, part of the story is the B2C section where we as agencies or together with schools, uh, we communicate directly with the uh, clients, the students. So B2B parts, uh, I think uh, there is no more need for that uh, big face-to-face -face interaction. All these workshops, agent trainings, panels, office visits were even before COVID-19, they were not efficient at all. As an agency, I was uh, seeing my uh, friends, uh, school owner friends or people working at schools. I, I like to see them, by the way. Uh, it's not about, <laughs> I don't want to see them, but seeing them in a workshop in London and then workshop in Berlin and then in our office, in their school, it, it wasn't just making sense. And at the end of the day, this was causing a huge economy. And what a student pays for a week, the part of the direct cost was getting lower and lower. The marketing budget, all, all those things are paid by the, by the students at the end of the day, uh, when they pay for their tuition. And uh, what they pay and what they get was getting unrealistic. And I think this COVID-19, is an opportunity for our industry for a correction uh, to reduce the overhaul and my crazy marketing budgets and to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. So I think using this kind of platforms in B2B area is uh, vital now and no one will be, be able to avoid it. Uh, considering the economical situation, we needed to be uh, financially efficient more than ever, and we will do. Getting back to uh, B2C parts, uh, we should be a little bit more careful uh, on that part because I, uh, during this kind of panels, I am always hearing that uh, our people in our industry are comparing our industry with airline industry or hotels industry, which our accommodation industry, which which is a big mistake because we don't have customers. As schools, you don't have customers, you have students. And as agencies, we don't have customers, we have clients. It's not like selling an airline ticket or a, a, a room in a hotel. We are, we, we are providing a very highly specialized professional service. And that's why instead of customers, they are our clients. So it's, we are talking about education. It's, it's much more serious than anything else. So uh, fairs will be still around. Uh, in marketing directly to the students, we will all of, of course use digital platforms, Instagram, social media, whatever, brochures. I don't think we need to print that much brochures anymore. Uh, maybe not, a, no more brochures will be printed within a couple of years by any of the schools. Uh, but at the end of the day, we still need to sit down with students and parents during a fair or in our offices so that we can explain them uh, what they are going to choose, what are the criteria on selecting a country, schools, e program or accommodation. So this still needs face-to-face -face interaction. Part of this face-to-face -face interaction will be through this kind of platforms. Again, we in our agency, we have started our online uh, counseling services like anybody else. And we are using our own platform instead of Zoom kind of things. So it's an integrating th thing with our CRM. Uh, but still making the final decision, uh, these platforms can won't be able to replace face-to-face -face talks in our offices. This, this part is temporary during this pandemic, COVID-19 thing, but by at the end of the pandemic, we will start talking to people face-to-face, -face, sit down, shake hands, at least in, in, in our part of the world, this is part of our culture as well. So this section will remain, but for the rest, promotional materials, 
marketing, advertising, everything is going to be digital. When it comes to B2B, it should be digital anyway. I, I don't want to see any more printed brochures, boxes arriving in my offices, trying to store them, handing out. You know, it's, it's not good for economy, but it's not also good for the environment, you know, and it's not efficient at all. Very true. Thank you, Mr. I think that's really interesting. And the way that you broke that down into B2B and B2C is, is really interesting. And just picking up on that point about the B2B, and I think, Andrew, I'm going to come to you on this. Um, I was talking to this, of course, this move to digital is not just affecting our sector. We look at it in other sectors, too. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently who works in banking, who used to fly around different cities in the US for different meetings, spending all of this money. And he's not done that this year. And I said to him, does that mean you're never going to go back to that? And he said, well, actually, he thinks that that's what people are saying, but that he will do because it will be the way that he differentiates himself from his competitor because his competitor will be the guy having the Zoom meeting and he'll be the guy in Chicago buying the client a beer over lunch. So, Andrew, as a, as a, as a, as a representative of a school group, do you actually think that this is how it's going to play out in terms of the B2B marketing? Or do you think in two years' time we're going to see all of the marketing staff of the schools back on the road, back in the offices, back walking down Istiklal Gadesi and meeting all of the Turkish agents as they always used to? Or is this really an inflection point? Are we actually going to see this change? Um, what do you think from a school perspective? I think it's probably a little bit early to tell. Um, I, I think that there's, on one level, I know that my, uh, my recruitment colleagues, you know, uh, international travel uh, is kind of in their blood, and actually a lot of them are actually quite addicted to, to, to traveling to far places and meeting friends and colleagues all over the world. So I don't think I don't think it's an, an either or situation. I think clearly, um, as Messi was saying, I think that the future is going to be one of, of appropriate blending. So there will be less uh, direct face-to-face -face communication on the B two B. Uh, level, but it won't be completely eliminated. Um, it, we'll just end up working smarter, I think, um, and we will, we will, yeah, I think that necessity will, will, will mean that, that everybody within our sector is going to have to um, shave their, their uh, marketing budgets, as, as Meta was saying. So, by definition, that will be a driver, um, but it won't eliminate, I don't see the total elimination of of um, a face-to-face -face interaction. I think one of the things that, that we all know within the uh, language travel sector and the international education sector is, is, it, it is a, it's a people business. It's about human interaction. It's about human development, it's not just with students, but actually with those of us who work with it. And, and that driver is never going to go away. We're just gonna have to think smarter. And I think we, we all of us, in our in our personal lives as well as professional lives, just manage seamlessly to to balance, if you like, virtual communication with real communication. We do that every day. You know, we do it without thinking. We do it actually without thinking. So in a way, it's, I, I think it becomes a false distinction between, um, if you like, analog forms of communication and digital forms of communication. I think the distinction is really between ineffective forms of communication and effective forms of communication. And that may be analog and it may be digital, but obviously the, the, the move is, is essentially towards digital because that's where efficiencies are, and that's where speed is and flexibility. But that doesn't that doesn't rule out the fact that we're gonna stop being a people business, we're gonna you know, enjoy each other's company, I don't think. Absolutely. Yeah, we can I think we're all desperate for some human interaction, aren't we? Some actual face-to-face -face interaction. And then Richard, coming to you and picking up on some of Messer's points there, particularly relating to B2C experience. And I think um, I sort of alluded to some of those, the risks in going digital when it comes to B2C in terms of the customer experience, or in this case, the student experience, um, their psychology, um, the fact that it's less personal and, and, and in certain markets, that personal connection is so important. In terms of um, you as a kind of digital consultant, what, what are the risks to going digital? And how can we minimise and mitigate those risks? Well, I think this is absolutely right that the, the human interface is, is so important and that, that ability to sit down with people is never going to go away. And even as a proponent of digital, I, I'm, I'm never going to go away from that point. It, it's so important. I think the reality is that, um, you know, it, it almost doesn't matter what we think as, as people sitting in a virtual room right here. It, it always comes back to what, what clients need. 
to make their buying decisions and to and to and to select their chosen provider and follow a brand. And whilst you know, typically I was having a conversation with an agent uh, from Brazil last night, and um, and she was saying how important it was to to be in the living room with the the, the family, talking to the parents and reassuring them of how safe this is going to be. And you know that that's that's beautiful, uh, a beautiful example of like um, personalizing the experience for a market. Um, so so yeah, nothing should really replace that if that is what a local market needs. But you're going to get some uh, consumers then and customers that, that need a different part to that experience. They need a digital element because that is their primary way of gathering information. So. You can say it's Gen Z, but it's not. It's all of us. We, we're all using our technology in a different way. And so being able to understand a brand um, through online means, to understand what a school stands for, to, to, to have that virtual tour of a place before you get there. This is where technology can really rise to support these things. Um, I, I think risks with going digital as an organization are, are considerable, and there's lots to consider there. Um, but, it, you know, inserting um, clever use of digital um, into your marketing is, is, I think, imperative these days. Mm -hmm. And how can as different brands, how can, and, and brands that are often very closely linked to the personalities that represent them, like how can those different brands differentiate themselves in a marketplace? So say if we're talking about B2B relationships, we've got an English UK, we've got nearly 400 language schools in the UK, for example. In, within that digital marketplace, how can they differentiate themselves effectively um, um, to be able to win the business that they're looking for? Well, when I was uh, working in uh, IH London, um, I sat down with the marketing team one day and, um, and asked them to list out all the USPs of that particular school. And um, there was a, a right royal list that we, we put up on a whiteboard. I then looked back through them all and, and I, I challenged every single one of them. And even you know a, a top school like that, it, it's very difficult these days to to prove a USP. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the need is to is to move across to 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 you know other things other than the product and the place that you're delivering it in the building and the interactive whiteboards. It's not about that. So it has to be about your values. It has to be what you stand for away from the commercial edge of what you're doing. What are your beliefs? Um, I spoke to a school on the South Coast um, a couple of months ago and uh, we were talking about values and, and what could you pull through from the past, from the founding era of your organisation. Um, and uh, he, he said, oh, well, we've got a Latin crest that stands for um, words, not swords. Uh, oh, my God. Well, exactly. You know, in this time where world conflict is so massive mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, people aren't getting on and there's huge divides in society. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let's go back to those basics. Why were we founded? What were we trying to achieve? And particularly the younger generation, um, you know, that really resonates, this idea of like standing for something greater than just teaching language. Mm -hmm. It's going to be bigger than that these days. So, so, so that's what can come across through digital means, through non-digital means, and uh, just, just tapping deeply into, into values, but in a genuine way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that can that can come out in a in an Instagram live. It can come out in a web page. It can come out in how you teach your lessons in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mr. So carrying on from that in terms of the brand values and how uh, language teaching centers can differentiate themselves digitally as an agent. And when at Atlas, when you're looking for partners and when you're thinking about your partners, what are you looking for? in terms of the digital world and the digital marketplace to be able to think, yeah, that partner, they fit with me, I'm going to work with them, or actually, I don't like that, um, I'm, that's not, they're not for me. Like, how do you, when you're looking at these, the digital marketplace, how do you differentiate and decide who you're going to work with? And, and is that a different set of decision-making criteria than um, in the non-digital world when you're seeing face-to-face -face or you're looking at a brochure or whatever it might be? Is that, has that changed your decision-making process? Well, uh, first of all, it's not us making the decision, it's the students and the parents, uh, their needs, how they change. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, uh, well, it's when you digitalize, uh, it's all about being, I think, user friendly. 
for your agency, for your students, and uh, for for your own stuff as well. So it's digitalization is not putting your just put your processes and your data information to digital and then ask people to process their bookings or getting information from there. So the design, user friendliness, and I'm sure Richard would have further comment on that, will make uh, the difference. You know, it's, everybody has the same technology, it's the, the same software languages are being used, but the design on how you, uh, how you uh, pass the technology, the information, the communication, uh, the design and user friendliness and the efficient technology behind it will decide, I think. So, and we will see some very inefficient money spent on technology and digitalization where, where uh, people will uh, not get any return on their investment, but there will be very wise investments on digitalization as well. Uh, so human factor, human being, so students is in the center and then the agencies. If you put them on the center and design everything accordingly, then you will be able to differentiate yourself. Looking at the industry, people are just copy pasting each other. Uh, so I cannot see really any, any school provider, any education provider differentiating themselves. Some of them are more user friendly, design is better, uh, and some of them are going to be there. So, uh, but at the end of the day, it's still the people you are working with us. Even if you, even if you are going to make an agent training on a digital platform, it's still, the efficiency is still determined by the people sitting in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. how, how good communication he is doing, how well he's explaining, how good information he's giving, how friendly he is, still is the main thing, the human factor. Absolutely. I think in terms of then how we can be have better, and Andrew, you mentioned the it's about effective communication, digital or face to face, yeah. and and how um, in terms of how schools can better work with agent partners to have a more integrated approach to marketing that moves beyond you know the sticker on the back of a brochure that I think you've seen done in the past. Like how how does that work? How are you thinking about that in terms of how to make that? Um, experience from the student and their influences more seamless and how digitization digitization god i can't say that word I can never say that word how that how how that helps support that integration and that seamless experience um have you got any thoughts on that sure yeah and i think i think the question about how how schools and, and agents can work together to mutually create digital content that is is is, in, is most effective is, is a question of, with two aspects to it really. I think obviously there's the practical side in terms of the digitization of, of content and I, I'll, I'll come to talk about that. But I think it's also important, I think that we set that in the context of the, 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 the context of partnership with, with agents and, and with schools. Because I think certainly from my point of view, and I know from, from our, our organization's point of view, you know, I don't think there's ever been a, a time in our sector's history where real meaningful partnership between schools and agencies is, is required and certainly you know we have always 100 percent believed in as, as Messer was saying and as, and as Richard was saying in, in that fundamental power of the agent mediated um, student relationship because that, that personalized um, uh, uh, relationship between an agent and, and a student is the very best way in our, in our opinion of, of students of making informed decision. So, so I think that's important context, and I think therefore that all digital communications that, that we create as schools are there to support that that partnership. Um, and as we've said, um, it, it's really important to understand that digital communications are never ever seen as something that replaces that personalised um, approach. They they can only ever be used to support it. Um, and I think. The only thing I would say about integration of, of messages around communication between agents and, and, and schools is, yes, on one hand, it's about integrating different media, and, and I can talk about that a little bit in, in, in a minute, but I think it's also 
important from my point of view to talk to, to think about an integration along along what what I think is the total student journey mm -hmm. all the way from the very beginning to the very end. And certainly within within our organisation, we always try to think of the journey that the student takes as one from unawareness to advocacy. And and obviously, what that means is that there's there's m multiple touch points along the point from the time that a, a student or a parent has never heard of King's, my organisation or, or another school, never even heard of the agency, all the way along all the myriad points at which they hopefully end up become, becoming an advocate mm -hmm. or an ambassador for the agency or, or, for, or for the school um, based on the service that they receive. And I think, I think if we as schools and, and agents can think strategically and work together about all the different points along that continuum that a student makes individually and understand the, where, where our role fits. And, and, and I think understand that we, we, as schools and agents, we've both got different roles in that journey, but I think we've got mutual responsibility for, for that student's journey from start to finish. So in other words, a student doesn't just become the, 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 the concern of a school when they walk through the school's doors, Neither, neither does a student stop being the concern of an agent when they when they enter the school. We're all responsible mutually for for, for both of those, but for, for that whole that whole journey. And I think we need to be seen as as schools and and agents and trusted as such by by parents and by students as working completely aligned together in support of that student's total journey. And so I suppose that 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 leads me to the the point about you know, the practical ways of that, how that can happen. And, and, and we've talked about the personalised experience. And I think one of the things that I think is most um, powerful potentially within the digital environment is the ability to create personalised, bespoke, co-branded opportunities um, rather than just putting a stamp on the back of a, of, a, of a brochure. So when we launched our smart brochure product earlier this year, we, we planned it last year that wasn't just conceived of being a more immersive experience for the students it was very much deliberately conceived of being a more personalized um, product for our agent partners so so our agent partners for example are able to include their own logo include their own profile picture include their own contact details include a personalized message to the to the student um, include their own assets, their own pictures of their own family. So what, what we're creating right at the very beginning of the process is genuinely, you know, using digital technology, is, you, is genuinely creating something which, which has come from both the agent and the school working together to, 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 to present as being something greater than some of their parts. And I think if we then take that concept and, and develop it through all the different ways in which we can communicate with students going forward. Lots of other co-branding opportunities around video, around VR tools that, that, that we can create, um, around a real sense of, of collaborative communication with, our, with what is our mutual client, the student. Um, that's, I think, the important thing. Practically, uh, we, you know, we can look at ways in which agents and prospective students obviously can, can, can talk in real time to student ambassadors, we can we can we can work closer together to to look at ways in which our own mutual students in our schools are communicated with and, and create blog posts and social media that we can share together. But the sharing possibilities within digital communication are obviously far greater and far more immersive um, than, than, than than the traditional analog. And I think so. I think yeah. Long-winded way of saying I think there's a we need to think strategically together about this whole journey. And, and once we got that as the framework for how we work together, then it gives us a roadmap as agents and schools to plot different paths of communication. That, I think, is the key, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a conflict to be managed be, with the conflict between agency and the schools. In the past, like 20 years ago, where there were physical barriers, agent was in relationship with the student up until he arrives. And then it was all about the schools. Now we don't have any more physical barriers. Schools are trying to be in correspondence with the students directly, even when they are in their home country. 
Uh, and on the other hand, agents are also trying to be in correspondence with the students, even after they arrive to their destination country. And correspondence data is one of the most valuable things in our world. Uh, the data you have and the sustainable correspondence is key. Mm -hmm. And here, the, a student from student side, which is the main important uh, person, parts in the whole story, they, they start getting bombarded with this correspondence from their agencies and schools, which are sometimes duplicating the information and it's coming over and over. Uh, so this, this area should be managed very well. So CRM integrations, this correspondence integrations, like school has an app, but as an agency, we have an app as well. So for the same thing, for the same purpose, there are two main parts trying to be in correspondence with the student even before they arrive. So this part will be required to be integrated to manage any conflicts between students and uh, between agencies and schools because we don't want any student to fed up with this information bombardment. Thanks, Mr. I think it's a really, a really interesting point about the, the blurring of lines created by integration and the kind of risks of that. Andrew, do you want to come back on that? And then I'm going to go to Richard for a, a view of of what he feels that we can um, do in terms of integration and the tools that are out there. Andrew, on, on that blurring of lines and how to manage that when you are when you are aiming for better integration. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, it, it, it's, it's obviously, a, it's a real issue. I think, as, as Messon said, I think, you know, use of CRMs, use of, use of uh, sh sharing data at the, at the raw part is, is, is important. And I think it's, yeah, but, but I think it's incumbent on, on all of us, both, both schools and, and, and agent, agencies, obviously to, to, to understand these risks and, and to manage the appropriate responses. And, uh, and yes, I don't think it's, um, it's, it's obviously something which, you know, it, it's not a simple fix. And there's, there's, a, there's a myriad of transactions going on and communications between lots of different students all the time. Um, but I don't believe that if, if we've got the framework that where we both understand our mutual responsibility to, to the to the student client that we can't actually work together to to to, to make that you know, a seamless experience for them um, it just requires us to to work smarter together i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then richard as a consultant who's got a view of the sector and perhaps of other sectors too how um can agent and and school partner work together and integrate what platforms or tools could they use where have you seen this done very well and message mentioned that there's not that much differentiating different um uh, different schools at the moment where have you seen it done very well that's bringing in some different tools that haven't been thought of what as a consultant would you like to see as a kind of ideal in terms of this maybe borrowing from other sectors thanks yeah I mean, just to pick up on Masood's earlier point and to slightly disagree, um, Masood, you said, um, you know, I don't think we should be looking at airlines and, and different other industries as our as a guidance. But but I, I would contest that in the sense that I think as, as we as society become more and more familiar with the very best apps and the very best integrations that are out there, airlines are a prime example of this. Um, um, <laughs> But also just, just a stupid example, like uh, um, I, I recently did my genetic thing on Ancestry.com to get my DNA and work out my ancestors. And just for a very simple thing of, of sending a sample off to a lab, um, I, I got some lovely updates about, you know, where things were at, what was happening now, DNA was being extracted, my results were coming soon. And it was just a really simple process, but I, I was getting messages left, right and center in a, in a controlled, branded, really nice, clear way. So I love Masood's point about, yeah, don't overwhelm students because this is all about students. And if you're cluttering up the communication for them, it, it's going to feel messy. And um, if it's, you know, if you're working with an agent and it's an agent school relationship, well, th there needs to be that transparency, but there needs to be a consistency of messaging as well uh, for, from the student's voice, so, for student's perspective. So Andrew's point about, you know, that mapping the whole journey is, is imperative. Um, other thoughts uh, that have, have come out and, and from, from memory as well of doing this, I think one of the criticisms I had of, of typical school agent relationships 
was that the relationship was often formed at high level in international workshops and fairs. So that it would be a leader or owner speaks to leader or owner, um, neither of whom necessarily, present company accepted, know um, quite what's going on down the organization in terms of content creation and what have you. So whilst there's clear understanding at the top level, what I often found was that um, the, the agent would be grabbing content from the school's website, pasting it on their website, causing massive duplication of content, which is a massive problem for, for, for Google ranking, um, you know, listings get penalized and you get demoted for that kind of thing. And also just a, a, a misunderstanding of use of image and sharing of material. And if something updates on one site, has it been replicated on another? And, and I think there's a need to have a, a deeper down connection within each organizational structure. So marketing person can talk to marketing person, sales to sales, admin to admin, um, admissions to admissions. And there's a richer dialogue. The, the problem, though, comes when, of course, um, you know, on each side, it's a many to many relationship. Agents are dealing with many schools, schools are dealing with many agents, and everyone has a slightly different process. So um, I, I think at the moment it's a really interesting time uh, with the slowdown through uh, COVID. Um, there is a lot of talk about, you know, how will we do things for the new normal? I don't actually believe the new normal will be a lot different from the old normal. I'll, I'll kind of go against the flow a little bit there. I think it's... That. I'm looking forward to the new normal, the better normal. <laughs> well, the better normal for sure, possibly. But as soon as students start flowing, um, it's going to be very hard to create the mental space to, to keep on going on this process improvement track that I think we can be on now. Uh, but, but the need for it is imperative. I mean, we've been banging on for years about the need, for example, to, to, to test before people arrive in the school. And you have schools going, no, we have to test them the first day and the first morning and lose all that time. Mm -hmm. But but now, lo and behold, it's possible to do remote testing because we're doing remote teaching. So I think progressing with these the, these you know, simple steps, really, where technology can do a better job, you know, it, the, the challenge will be pushing on with all that when when students are crowding back in and schools are full and and happy and back to normal, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have a question come in, and so we're inviting um, participants to um, post their questions to our um, panel in the Q&A area of, the, of this platform. So do post questions that you've got. One question from Lucy is about how much do we think we need to focus as an industry um, on industry USPs? So on the USPs, on the reasons why people should be thinking about language travel rather than just individual brand USPs, and how do we do that together? And I think that's a really interesting question as well from the point of view of someone who works in a, as a national association, is that we have a huge um, range um, in terms of the breadth and the depth of the UK offer, and that is a brilliant USP, but equally there is a range in the, uh, in the, in the members of English UK and the, and the ELT centres, the accredited ELT centres in the UK in terms of how far along the road they are in terms of digital, how much budget they've got, how sophisticated they are. And I think that's interesting about the how much we need to focus as an industry on selling the industry and how that comes across in digital um, and on digital marketing. Um, Mesut, thoughts from your side as an agent in terms of the, of the market in Turkey. Do you think there is a need um, to focus not just on your brand or the brands of your partner schools, but on the uh, on the industry USPs and how does that come across in terms of your digital marketing? I think uh, focusing on uh, the whole industry on pandemic period is much more important than ever because uh, people should be aware that there is still language study is going on, part on partial online, partial physically, sometimes physically 100%. So uh, people uh, just sometimes assume that the, the, the schools are not open at all even not online. So in pandemic times, I think uh, focusing on the industry, language travel industry is trying to promote and trying to let people know about what's happening uh, is more important than normal times. Uh, but if you are talking about the after the new normal, uh, there is always a balance uh, between promoting the industry and the individual uh, USPs. 
Uh, same thing works for our agencies. You know, we sometimes cooperate with our com uh, competitors, similar to what you are doing as schools uh, in the destination country. Uh, but uh, during pandemic times, uh, focusing on industry is much more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agree in times of crisis. Andrew, do you agree for that from a school perspective, especially now when market confidence is so low and there's a need to restore that market confidence? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we would typify it as it's destination marketing as much as it is, you know, sort of individual school marketing. I think we, the, and I think it's not just about the pandemic, is it? I think there's a, there's a general sense that all of us in language travel and international education, we all, we all fell into this sector because we are internationalists, because we believe in the power of international communication, we believe in the power of, of lived experience um, in a new culture and a new environment. And, and that, that, that's why we're all here. And, and that, that message is also, you know, has been under attack, uh, not, not, nothing necessarily to do with the pandemic, it's been under attack because of geopolitical forces that have been in play for the last um, few years as well. So we all, I think, have a, have a responsibility to constantly push the benefits of uh, of an international experience, and and it, it's it, it's incumbent upon us to use digital technology, not necessarily to to, to go down the, the route of, of digital learning at the expense of a of a lived experience. Or obviously, we all schools have had to move into digital learning by by definition in the, in the pandemic. But we don't certainly see ourselves. That's not that's not our USP, and that's not our our, our raison d'etre going forward. We would only ever do digital digital learning, if you like, as a complement to our core, which is which is which is you know, teacher interact interactivity. Um, that's not the kind of, uh, and that's within this panel, not not, not really what what our what our business is. Um, I come back to the point about you know experience. Digital technology is. It, it, it's a false distinction between an experience, whether it's analog or, 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 or digital. If you if you, if you have a quality digital experience, the emphasis is on the word quality, not not digital. And as we were talking about before, use of videos to promote countries or to promote the sector, use of technology which is a lot more immersive and 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 more visceral in terms of the engagement. We we, we should we definitely be using that kind of thing. To, to really promote, you know, at the macro level, why language travel is so damn important, because mm -hmm. it's increasingly important. Yeah, travel with purpose. I think I'm going to put you on the spot for our kind of final question. So I'm going to give you a bit of fair warning while I introduce it, is I'm going to looking for predictions for some crystal ball gazing about what, um, in terms of the digital use of digital in the digital space, what the language travel industry is going to look like in two years and in five years' time. I think this is, I think it's interesting. We, we had a, a session at the English UK Summit a few months ago about, um, and we had someone who was talking about new trends within travel. And uh, it was all about slow travel and how there was this interest in, um, funnily, in like travel by bike or camping. Um, because and um, and the question came up: Is that because we didn't have any other option, right? Like in the summer in the UK, no one you couldn't really go overseas, so um, people went camping. It was outdoors; it was available. But the minute that it's possible, we're all going to get a flight and go to the south of Spain and get a bit of sun. Thanks very much. Uh, like I'm interested in 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 that. Like, is how much of this is a temporary change, and how much are we expecting to stick around? And then, indeed, what is the future going to look like? We had a very quick. Um, rate of change and innovation this year because it had to happen. It had schools had to go online. We've had to have online meetings and online conferences. We've been talking about having online conferences and training at English UK for years, and we've and then suddenly we had, we did it in the space of a few months because we had to. But how much and what will that rate of change continue, or will it slow down? As Richard said, when the imperative changes and schools. Um, and, um, are faced with a deluge of students as we hope they will be and it's back to trying to um, improve your balance sheet and 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 that's the priority after a really, really difficult year or 18 months um, will the rate of change continue or we will we see a bit of a dip and a slowdown and and everyone will just settle down and thank well thank god that's over let's focus on what we know 
and let's focus on on teaching students and and we will see a return to the to the days of old that's why i'm interested in i'm picking um what we're going to see in terms of trend over the next couple of years and and further into the future richard to you first Thanks. Thanks for giving me no time other than that intro. Uh, no, that's all good. Um, I think I think the, the organisations uh, that are going to be in the sector and around in five years time are going to have very integrated digital processes that rise to support the client journey. Um, and, and, you know, we've talked about the difficulties of integration, but also it's important to remember the benefits that, yes, you have happy customers, you increase conversion, you position better online in the first place, so your funnel is wider. Um, you reduce unnecessary staff time, repetition time, you reduce cost and you boost profit. So that, that's why those organisations are going to be around, because they're going to be more profitable and sustainable. Additionally, I think education is going to keep on changing and I think it will become imperative that the educational offer will be available synchronously as in the face to face, whether online or in a classroom in, in a live, we're all in the same room situation, but also asynchronously that just like uh, Masood mentioned the need to have uh, training and, and support for agents available in an asynchronous, we can watch the video when we want to kind of way. I think the whole of education needs to go that way. Um, more lessons should be filmed, more content should be available. What if you're, you, you're ill today and you missed the lesson? Well, why not go and relive that lesson with a VR headset so you can feel like you're in the room? It's all technically possible already. Personalization is going to change and continue to change massively. Um, I have a, a big frustration with things like mass email marketing, even mass social media, to be honest, that it's just pumping out the same stuff in a very kind of um, kind of it, it's not, not, not a particularly um, sort of um, inbound marketing kind of way. It, it's very much about kind of just pushing out your message regardless. Mm -hmm. That has to change. We have the ability through technology to customize and personalize, but that has to go further. Right now, schools are doing very well um, because they can listen carefully to individuals again who have individual needs and adapt to those needs. But as soon as it expands out again, the risk is you're going to lose that ability to listen to the individuals and that will become imperative to gain market share and to keep on growing in the future. And also, I think the organization's final point that will survive and do well are those that are willing to be playful and experiment as if they have nothing to lose. We've seen some really interesting innovation from some schools over the last few months because they had literally nothing to lose. They were backed up against a wall and look at what they've pulled out of the bag. That experimentation, that playfulness, that, that ability to just mess it up sometimes and learn quickly will be increasingly important in a world where we've become very systems and processes and, and very locked into certain ways of working. Thanks, Richard. That makes me feel hopeful. Messer, do, do you feel hopeful for the future and for the future of digital in language travel? Yeah, I am very positive about the future. New normal will be, will be a better normal. We will be much more efficient, working more efficient, communication more efficient. And it will also reduce the cost for the students. So there will be more students uh, capacity to to study and we will see partial online programs they they are already in there uh, but at the end of the day uh, traveling abroad is not mainly about studying whatever you, whatever whatever you are studying doesn't matter it could be a master's undergraduate or language it's about being physically abroad and it's all about the experience and as we human beings exist this won't change so it's not about getting the information from the classroom or from a video, live video. That, that's, that's not the main issue. So I am very, very, very positive and we will see much more efficient, cost efficient uh, industry for both sides, schools and the agencies. Thanks, Mr. Andrew? Yeah, I guess I've, I've got maybe two main predictions. I think I predict that in uh, two years time, schools will be crammed with students because I think I think, well, apart from anything else, all the schools have got lots of uh, empty classrooms and they're going to need those, those classrooms crammed with students. And so the imperative, and, and of course, there is a pent up demand. There is a still a demand for, for, for um, and a, and a huge desire for travel, 
for er experiential learning and travel. That isn't going to disappear, and, and no amount of digital um, learning is going to stop that fundamental desire uh, amongst the cohort of students who, who, who are responsible to our sector. The other, the other question, the other prediction I would make is that um, printed brochures will, will not exist in two years. Caput, uh, I say that as somebody that spent most of the last 20 years designing and, and working on, on printed brochure material every summer for since about 1999. I think. <laughs> um, but but I think yeah. So there's a distinction here, obviously, between the the the, the felt and the lived experience that we are promoting, which is, which is that visceral sense. I mean, a new city. You know, kids love new cities. They they want to be part of that. It's not going to go away. But there's a massive distinction between that and and the old school ways of, of, of communicating with them. So absolutely, as as as, as both panelists have said, um, it's going to be a blended environment. Technology that we are that we are being forced to accelerate now is going to blend more seamlessly with that lived experience. Um, but, and, and, and we will be recruiting students, I think, pretty much exclusively through digital platforms within, within 12 to 24 months. Exclusively, I think, that's the key. They're never gonna to wanna to stop coming. Exactly. That's a that's a brilliant point, Andrew, on which to end. Thank you very much. I think in terms of this has been a really interesting discussion. So thank you so much. In terms of some key takeaways, I think for me, some sound bites, two sound bites. One was the uh, I think it was you, Andrew, was that effective communication is effective communication, whether face to face or digitally. Um, and that's important. And then I think another point that came up from Richard on authenticity. And that's what's that thing come across so much this year um, and why these kind of coming, comings together at conferences are so important is that we all authentically believe that uh, language travel changes lives um, and that if we work together um, and collaborate, then that is for the good of the student, for the good of their family, for the good of uh, the agent partner, for the good of the school partner and for the good of the sector and that that collaboration is important. I think applying those principles about effective communication and an authentic belief in, in the fact that language travel changes life and that collaboration and working together is key is going to make whatever we do digitally or face to face in terms of marketing work in the end. That's what's going to lead to successful businesses and to the sector recovering and thriving as we move forward um, so thank you so much i feel more positive now that's good on a rainy day in london and um, thank you to everybody for joining and ironically for a digital session i don't have a stop broadcast button so richard please could you stop the broadcast thanks very much thank thanks you. a lot thank you. Thank you.